yeah good morning good morning uh, prince good morning dev prince can you pray and lead uh, today's session yeah it's fine oh. yeah. thank you dev thank you thank you lord to keep uh, from our heart lord that you are giving us a wonderful day as in the first day of the week lord thank you and you bless us thank you this time i submit in your hand lord as we are going to learn from the book of john lord help us and uh, give us some wisdom and knowledge so that we can understand well lord thank you your deep things uh, reveal to us lord thank you and apply in our uh, daily life lord thank you as and all the student also first nancy in jesus name i pray amen Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Prince. Um, so before we go forward, how are the assignments going? I hope you have seen the questions. Yesterday, I uh, filled uh, assignment two, but uh, again, there is showing uh, you need to fill that. But if we uh, fill two once, that it should not be so the fill again. Yesterday uh, I saw that. Ah. Okay. No, I didn't understand, Prince. Can you can you explain to me? Yeah. So, yesterday I filled uh, assignment two, my second one. Hmm. Then uh, uh, I submitted it, and there is uh, I opened again, and they are showing that uh, I need to fill again that. Yeah, so I have given you an option uh, to resubmit. Okay, in case you know some, there was some issue in the oh. first one, because sometimes students hit submit, yeah. and then they are not yeah. able to. They don't fill in certain questions and all. So if you left yeah. anything incomplete in the previous one, you just uh, take up another form and you fill the questions. Oh, okay. Yeah. If you've already completed it, there's no need to open another form and fill it. Oh, okay. Fine. Yeah, you finished it, right? Yes. Ah, then leave it. You don't have to do another form. Okay. Ah, uh, how about the others? Have you seen the questions? Are you okay with it? I think it's little simple this time compared to other other uh, courses. The the final one, ma'am. Yes. The, the subjective one. No, all all of them uh, or the objective ones. I think this semester it's co comparatively easier. No, they've. Yeah. Uh, my questions. <laughs> yeah, I, I've yeah. done the objective one. The, the okay. longer one, I haven't I haven't done it yet, but I'll okay. be doing it in this or this week. I think we'll, we'll yeah. finish it. Yeah, you can finish it, and moreover, the questions are not from James. So there's nothing for you to wait for. You can just go ahead and do the, uh, you know, the third uh, test also, because you already yeah. completed. This week we have one uh, few uh, mm -hmm. assignments. Finished, so I will finish that one and I'll start. Uh, that one. Okay, 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 okay. So all other classes are completed. <laughs> Maybe mine is the last one still going on. Yeah, I think pretty much we have, we have done with all the classes. I think. Okay, 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 okay. Great. So anyway, praise God. Uh, we've had sufficient time. You know, we haven't rushed through anything, so which is most important. Uh, and you get a good grip on things. I would encourage you. See whatever I have shared, isn't it? Uh, so I have shared the uh, key points. Okay, though we have done a verse by verse study, there is so much more in each of the verses, but just the key points have been highlighted. Uh, so, as I've shared earlier, you could also go and refer to um, there is uh, David Guzik, I uh, told you, Blue Letter Bible or EnduringWord.com. So, he has these two websites where he also follows a word by word study. So, that can be helpful. Uh, you know, it, it could be um, uh, one of the resources that you use. The best thing to do is to read the, the passage many times, read it several times. After that, you can 
start to look at some commentary. So David Guzik is a really wonderful one, which uh, even I refer to quite a bit. Also, there are um, uh, expository teachings from uh, a church group called Calvary Chapel. So uh, some, you know, again, you, we can listen to a lot of commentaries, but the we have to be very careful to bring out the right meaning. So for that, the best thing to do is to read the passage many times. That is the best thing. Then you can also use a resource like Esod because then it will give you the Greek meaning of the words and, you know, how uh, you can compare the words and know the actual meaning uh, of uh, the exact word which was used. So use Esod. That's also helpful. There are a couple of commentaries that it already comes with. So that will also help you a lot. Then, uh, what else? Yeah. So the other nice thing you can do is you can go to a resource like BibleGateway.com. Uh, it's just where you can read the Bible. Okay. But you can get it in different versions. So to understand the essence of what is being said in a passage, sometimes an easier version of English will be helpful. So you can go to, um, you know, uh, uh, we usually, generally we use NKJV, then uh, you could look up, for an easier English, you could look, look up something like an NIV, uh, you know, and uh, for the original way in which it was written, you can look up the Amplified. So when you look at different translations, that will also help. And I think you must have already done, you know, some uh, translations are very like word to word. So um, passages uh, like KJV version and all, it's it's the translation is quite accurate from the from the hebrew and the greek but then you have certain other versions like um, uh, you know the message bible the pas uh, the passion translation which bring out more of the essence so they are not word to word or accurate in terms of the translation that has been done so uh, versions like that, which are newer and more simplified ones, be a little careful because they are more paraphrased versions. So they won't give you the exact meaning, but they might give you the essence of what that passage is saying. So you know, this is how you have to be uh, careful in uh, understanding the meaning. So though we have gone through these books five books uh, in our course i would encourage you to go back and you know meditate further meditate further and you can keep building on the knowledge that you have uh, picked up you know from these uh, books for example just i think hebrews this is my third or fourth year of teaching the the book uh, so Every year that I've taught, you know, initially my understanding is a little bit. And then the next year there are new things that I see in the in the same passages. And then following year, um, you know, I've seen new thing, even newer things in the same passages. And so each year I'm so excited to see uh, the truth, which is already in it. But I have not had the understanding, you know, three years ago, four years ago about the same passage. So um, basically what I'm trying to say is that it's a great opportunity, wonderful opportunity. And uh, don't let it go. Do your best to uh, go back to the books of the Bible as if you've never read it before. And each time try to do a thorough study. So then what happens? You learn the truth and then we are able to apply the truth so don't stop because your course is getting over okay never do that because that's not the right attitude at all the bible is a speaking and a living book which will speak to us every day you know even into uh, eternity because god's heaven and earth will pass away but his word will not pass away so i just want you to continue to be curious about what the word has in it okay so now let's just go to our passages here from the book of james and as i shared uh, since at apc we have done a study on the book of james you already have notes for it so it makes your work so easy. You just have to, uh, you know, go go to the notes and uh, read it up. So please do that. Last uh, class, we stopped 
when in uh, verse five, I think so. Yes. So we stopped there, verse five. And we said that uh, initially, you know, James was talking about he's talking to a Jewish audience, and uh, he was um, quite knowing of their situation, which is that they were going through persecution, and there were a uh, lot of um, things in the in the uh, gathering, or at that time it was not called the church or ecclesia, but the gathering of these believers that needed to be addressed. So with all these things in mind, you know, James is speaking to the believers. So the first thing that he uh, talked about was to have a positive attitude or an attitude that um, shows our dependence in God. So he says, you know, when you go through tribulation, count it all joy, brethren. And then, you know, he uh, adds to the fact that when we go through these difficulties, as we've seen in Second Peter, it will build up character. And when character is built up, you know, we have a sense of hope which cannot be taken away from us. And then he says the important thing when we are going through trials of all kinds is to have wisdom because we need to know what to do in that difficult situation. So he says, okay, how to get wisdom? The main source of wisdom obviously is God. So he says, you ask God. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach and it will be given to him. And I explained to us how God is a generous giver. He does not withhold anything from us. And he does not um, scold us or ill-treat us because we are lacking. Okay, So that is something which we have observed. Now, he goes on to sharing about the importance of faith. Okay, he says, um, but uh, let him who ask, ask in faith. Okay. Uh, class, just give me a moment. I'll just be back. Thank you. Hope you can hear me well. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Sure. All right. So he says God is generous and he will give abundantly to all who ask him. So, and then he says the way we must ask is with faith. What makes our prayer effective? Believing in our hearts, isn't it? So, First, we believe with our hearts, then we speak with our mouths, and that's how we see the answer to our prayer. So he says, the important thing when we approach God is faith, and we must ask with faith, uh, without doubting. And then he goes on to say that when we ask with doubt, then you know one should not expect to receive the answer from God. Because what is lacking? Faith is lacking in that situation. So when we pray, the important thing is to have faith. So even when we ask God for wisdom, have faith. And then he points out you know, something uh, which has to do with uh, the um, attitude. Or you could even say, you know, the, the um, um, sort of un... Um, like it, it's still Im immature character. Uh, of a person because he says that if at all we ask but we don't believe then that person is a double-minded man who is a double-minded man a double-minded person is somebody who is not making a firm decision the person is uh, holding on to option a as well as option b and, you know, it's like unable to decide. Am I going with option A? When I talk, it sounds like I want A. When I talk, 
talk after some time, it sounds like I want option B. So what is it that you want? Is it A or B? Be very clear. So double-minded person is that kind of a person who doesn't make a clear decision. So when it comes to our prayer life and our faith in God, what James is saying is don't be double-minded. Don't say things like, God, if you do this for me, great. If God doesn't do it, I have another idea. I'll just figure it out. So then what is it? Are you really fully depending on God or like what, what is it? So we must not misunderstand this as be uh, that God is asking us to be um, uh, unplanned or unwise. That's not what God is saying. But he's saying when we are showing our dependence on God, you know, let it be single minded where we are determined determined to put our full trust in God. So this attitude or uh, this this uh, part of us being double-minded, you know, that is something we must work on and get rid of. And uh, you know, sometimes double-mindedness can also be um, uh, something that is influenced by the, the demonic. So if we sense that, hey, you know, not able to get rid of this double-minded attitude or behavior we are, uh, and, and that it is a demonic influence, you can even bind it. You can even bind it in the name of Jesus and uh, be set free from it because God wants us to have single-minded focus. You know, don't be all over the place because what what does it say? A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. We become unstable because we are not able to make decisions. Okay. So when it comes to asking God, trust that God will bless you. He will hear your prayers. Now going to verse 9. I know that we have not gone through the full chapter because again, it will take time. You all have the uh, text in front of you. So just follow along. So verse 9. Now. He's addressing the um, the situation of having different social uh, uh, strata or classes in the same church. Does it happen today? Yes, it happens today. Unless a church is specifically for uh, uh, you know a, so a particular <coughs> social class of people. But we know in the kingdom of God that all kinds of people are welcome. So here in the uh, gathering of Jewish believers, James noticed that some people are rich or they have more possessions and, uh, 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 you know, resources as compared to others. So some are rich while some are poor. So he, he talks about how to treat people. You will see this in many different passages in James as well. But here he's starting out and he's saying, let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation. So he's saying, when God blesses materially okay, uh, a particular uh, person who is poor, let him be happy. Now, he also tells the rich person, he says the rich in his humiliation or he says that a person who is rich should be okay to be humble before the Lord. Okay, it doesn't mean that you know God is going to uh, bring down the rich person or humiliate a rich person. No, but it means the rich person should be happy walking with humility. Humiliation and humility, there's a big difference. They are not the same thing. So humility is to carry an attitude of reliance on God. Then he says. Because of, as a flower of the field, he will pass away. So he is just telling the rich people to uh, realize that life here on earth is not permanent. Similarly, holding on to riches and having riches is also not permanent. So how can uh, you know somebody be, become proud uh, because they have resources? That would be very uh, immature again. So he says, so let the rich brother in his humiliation. Now coming to verse 11. For no sooner has the sun risen with the burning heat that it withers the grass, its flower falls and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuit. So he's just referring to the temporary status of our life here on earth and the temporary status of the riches excuse me riches that people hold on to yeah now coming to verse 12 
you see you would find in james he's addressing the issues and he is uh, quickly jumping to new issues so excuse me we could feel that there is a disconnect between the topics but that's not the case you know we are the ones who put the numbers james chapter 1 james chapter 2 but when james originally wrote this he never had chapters and verses he was just addressing different issues so now about how to uh, express our reliance on god whether we are poor whether we are rich he he talked about it now verse 12 he is going to talk about temptation so he says blessed is the man who endures temptation for when he has been approved he will receive the crown of life which the lord has promised to those who love him so he is encouraging the people to overcome temptation and uses the word endure endure has to do with pressure it has to do with uh, you know a certain timing something that doesn't get over immediately requires endurement endurance so when it comes to temptation as well you know we might have to struggle a little uh, under the temptation but he's encouraging the believers and he's saying if we overcome then we will receive a crown of life which the lord has promised for those who love him so he's saying come on believer you must overcome temptation there is a crown waiting for you then he share some truth about temptation in verse 13 he says let no one say when he is tempted i am tempted by god for god cannot be tempted by evil nor does he himself tempt anyone so this is very important he is letting the believer know that god is not the source of temptation so whenever we say i am going through a tough time and uh, god is testing me have you heard that it's typical in many cultures people believe that it is god who puts them through a challenging time it is god who gives sickness to them it is god who um uh, wants people to endure you know uh, poverty and misery and despair and depression and loss and all those things but that's not the god of the bible as per what we are reading yes there are these challenges in the world simply because we are in the world and you know the world has these challenges but it's not to say that god puts it on people also temptation god does not put temptation on people and say okay let me see how is this person going to overcome the temptation if they overcome well and good if they don't overcome i'm going to punish them so god is not putting temptation on anyone but in the world do we have temptation we do one thing to settle very clear james chapter 1 God is not the source of temptation. Now, verse fourteen, he explains where does temptation come from. He says, "But when one is tempted, when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed, remember we've talked about this earlier that even a born again believer carries what is known as the flesh. Flesh has to do with the evil desires of the soul." the uh, the soul and the body these evil desires when we don't overcome them how to overcome the flesh only one way crucify okay there's no question of counseling the flesh or you know uh, pacifying the flesh convincing the flesh no the bible teaches us we have to walk with self control which is a fruit of the spirit and crucify the desires of the flesh so when we crucify the flesh that's when these temptations will cease however because we are all battling with flesh here on the earth uh, there will be temptation and it is coming from he says our own desires so when i am tempted the problem is not god the problem is in me in my flesh my own desires and enticed then he talks about the 
progression of temptation. We have studied about this when we uh, did Believer's Authority, uh, also in the human soul. I'm sure you have studied about this. So what is the progression of temptation? He says that when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. So he says thoughts will lead to action. So there is a desire in our flesh. I'm just giving you a simple example. Uh, if at all, you know, there is uh, um, some food in our house, which is very rich and it's a uh, little bit is okay. But if you eat too much, it's not good for your health. But it is there. What happens? There is a desire. Generally, it starts with a thought. When we say, oh, wow, you know, I can have a little bit of this. It's so tasty. I will be um, satisfied with this sweet. And uh, so it's the thought process. And maybe you are battling the temptation and you're saying, no, no, no. I've already had uh, 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 one bowl. I don't think I should have another bowl. So you're just battling with this temptation. But the desire is within you. But we are told in the thought life, when we lose so it says, when desire has conceived, that means the desire has overtaken. So I am in a place where I'm thinking it will be so nice if I can have one more bowl of that sweet. So the desire, and I'm giving a green signal to my desire. Say, okay, go ahead. It's okay. Nothing will happen. I'll just have it. So when I say, okay, go ahead, desire has conceived, then it will lead to action. So what is that action? The action is I am indulging in, um, you know, <clears throat> eating way more than what I'm supposed to eat. So then I say, okay, I'll just go ahead and eat. So there is action to it. Now, take the same and apply it to other things. Stealing, robbery, there is uh, money which doesn't belong to us. So in our minds, if we give ourselves a go ahead, you know, there are all these arguments going on, but then you give yourself a go ahead and explain, justify and say nothing. I'm not doing anything wrong. So once desire has conceived, then it will give birth to sin or you do the act. You actually do it. So that is sin. OK, so when you act on it and then sin happens, it said when it is full grown, brings forth death. What is the wages of sin? The wages of sin is death. So when whenever we sin, the result is going to be death, corruption. So we must remember that. But it begins with our thought life, with a desire. And where is the desire coming from? Not from God, but from our flesh. That's what James is explaining now. He continues to uh, encourage the believer and talk about temptation some more. And verse 16, he says, so don't be deceived, my beloved brethren, meaning don't think that God is tempting you and get into temptation. Don't do that. Okay? Know that you have to work on yourself. That's how you will overcome temptation. And verse 17, he um, uh, shows the real character of God. Earlier, he said, when we ask for wisdom, God is very faithful. He will give generously to us. Once again, he shows a generous character of God in verse 17. And he says, every good gift, every perfect gift is from above. Meaning, God is a God who does everything perfectly. He will not give us something that is faulty. Okay, So think about the Holy Spirit. He is what? He's a blessing to us. He's a gift who is given to us. Is he perfect? Yes, he's so perfect. Think about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You know, prophecy, tongues, um, uh, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, discern, discerning of spirits. These are all gifts from God. Are they perfect? Yes. Now we can talk about how man applies it and in the application things can go wrong. But is the gift perfect? Very much. So every gift of God, you know, again, you can look at so many other things in the Bible. Life is a gift from God. Every blessing is a gift from God. You know, uh, uh, daily bread, resources, provision is a gift from God. Children are a heritage. They are a gift from God. You know, they are ar like arrows in one's quiver, we are told. So everything that is coming from God is perfect. How do you think God can give you temptation, which is imperfect? So God does not tempt anyone. So he's talking about the character of God, how God is so generous. He makes and provides uh, perfect gifts. And uh, 
he says that god is very single minded so he says the the gift comes down from the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning so basically he's saying earlier he said don't be double minded you know i want this also i want that also no make up your mind what is it that you want you can't have both similarly now he's talking about the attitude of god and he's saying god is very single minded he made up his mind that he wants to bless us he won't go back on it you know he won't do one thing and then change his mind and do something else so don't be afraid god is generous god is good his gifts are very good and perfect so whatever you receive from god even the calling on your lives it is good it is perfect the anointing on your life the grace on your life all this is good it is perfect and there is no shadow of turning which means that when god gives tomorrow he won't change his mind and say okay you just you know uh, parcel it back to me he'll never do that once he gives it to you he knows that he wanted to give it to you because it belongs to you so you can be thankful rejoice and use that gift for the glory of god okay so now let's go to the next section here from verse 18 what do we see here now here we are talking about the word of god okay ha uh, about the word of god so in verse 18 he says of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures so then my beloved verse 19 my beloved brethren let every man be swift to hear and slow to speak slow to wrath 20 for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of god so a little bit about anger he talks about it so he says see how did how did we all um uh, come to know god come to uh, love him because he loved us isn't it we all experienced the love of god so it was the love of god which produced the righteousness of god in us it was not the wrath of man or you know somebody telling us uh, don't do this do that and giving us all the rules strictly putting us on the track to righteousness that's not how we have become righteous but we have received god's love his kindness that's how righteousness has uh, taken root in us so similarly he is saying how is it going to be useful if we are filled with anger and you know we we do what we do motivated by anger so that's why he says come on let's not do that um and you know he gives a nice tip there he says be swift to hear slow to speak wrath so he's saying how can i overcome being angry and saying evil things when i'm angry have control on the words that we speak so be slow to speak we may feel like i'm going to say all these things and hurt the person but no be slow to speak even if you're feeling angry be quick to hear hear more that will help us to overcome our anger now 21 again he encourages them to live a holy life he says therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls so he talks about how we put it is walk in the spirit now paul said it like that walk in the spirit or be led by the spirit not by the wickedness of the flesh and also receive with meekness the implanted word meaning humbly listen to god's word and he says implanted word how should the word be it should come and settle down in our hearts remember the parable of the sower the sower sows the seed but there are some seeds which don't take deep root what happens to such seeds they cannot grow up they cannot produce fruit instead if the word is planted in our heart then what will happen you know it will do its work it will cleanse our hearts it will direct us in the ways of god and you know it will really strengthen us spirit soul and body so he says in this in that manner believer 
receive the word of God be planted in you. In verse 22, he says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. Verse 24, for he observes himself, goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. So again, you know, he's saying, let the word sit in you like a seed in the ground. Then it will develop roots. It will produce um, uh, it will grow, it will produce its fruit. Now, after talking about the implanted word, he says, be doers of the word and not hearers only. So have you ever heard of a doctor who has only taken online classes, five years, studied online, never went to hospital, um, never treated a patient? And can such a doctor be qualified with a degree and said, okay, you know, great, you've never seen a patient, you've never done practicals, you've only done theory, it's great, you come, we will uh, give you the permission to operate on people. No, nobody would do that because it's not enough to just hear and know theoretically, you know, the, the uh, subjects, but one has to have practice, they have to do it. It's when they do it that, you know, the, the fruit of what they've learned. Okay, I've learned this, but then I have done it and it has benefited a patient and experience grows from that. So, see, there is value in doing something. Only theory will not help. In the same manner, when it comes to our engagement in the word of God, it's not helpful to know. I know, but I don't do anything. I know about Holy Spirit, I know about gifts of spirit, I know about word of God, I know about worship, but I don't, I don't, uh, you know, worship or anything, you know, I don't uh, do any ministry, I don't serve anyone. How does it help? We know everything, but we are doing nothing. So he's saying, come on, believer, you have to be a doer of the word. Don't just be listening. Listening is good, but doing is also important. And that is why uh, 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 whenever we have, you know, things like Bible studies and all, you're all Bible college students and you will be working with people. It's very nice. Okay, You can have Bible studies, teach people God's word, but also help them to do the practical. So give them some opportunity and uh, uh, ask them, okay, now uh, uh, evangelism, go ahead, share the gospel with two people and come and tell us about your experience. So whenever we study God's word, we have to do that word. You know, that's how we grow in God's word. So don't just hear, but do. And he gives this example. He says, do we ever look at the mirror and imagine, you know, your hair is all over the place. Sunday morning, you're going to church. You woke up and your hair is like a mess. Do you just go as it is? No, you would set it right. So the person who looks at the word or who reads the word, studies the word and never makes corrections in their lives. It's like a person who looks at the mirror and who does not take action. So he says, don't be like that. Instead, be a one who will apply the word. Now coming to verse 26 and 27, he says, if anyone among you thinks he is religious, now you see another subject. So he has jumped to another subject. So maybe in the church, there were people who were thinking that they are very godly. They are following God with all that they have within them. So he says, if any person thinks that they are religious, he says, here are certain characteristics that that person should have. One is tongue. Okay, if they don't control, if he does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. So he's saying that somebody who does not control their tongue but speaks evil, such a person, even if they say I am godly, they are not godly according to the standards of God's word. Okay, so he says control the tongue. Don't let the tongue be an evil, uh, you know, a source of evil. 
in your body. Verse 27, he says, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. So what is true godliness? So he is saying that true godliness is to show kindness, compassion and generosity. So how do you do that? He, in this context, he's saying that, have you ever helped people who are so needy? And he points out widows and orphans. Widows and orphans because they don't have people taking care of them. You know, somebody lost a husband, uh, a family lost a father and, uh, you know, uh, mother, parents. They are in need. These are needy people. So he says, if you say you are godly, you should be one who is compassionate and generous to the needy. So do you ever help people in need? If you do, and you know, particularly here, he says, so helpless, such helpless people, widows, orphans, then you are a godly person. And he also goes ahead and he says that one who keeps themselves unspotted from the world. Unspotted from the world means living a righteous life, living a holy life. Now, just think about it. You know, somebody who claims to be godly, but it's not, that person's not compassionate. Somebody who claims to be godly speaks evil, you know, gossip, slander, all those things, curses from their mouth. Then somebody who claims to be godly, but fully, you know, one foot in the world, one foot in the kingdom. So living a very worldly life. Does it, does it add up? It doesn't. So he's telling the believers, if you are a true believer and a godly believer, you will be compassionate, generous, ministering to the needy, speaking things that are uh, a blessing, you know, edifying words uh, to people and also pursuing godliness and holiness. Now, that is what is, you know, he says, religiosity or in other words, you can say True piety. Piety is another word which is used to show godliness. A godly person is like this, pursuing all the good things. So these are uh, some thoughts in um, his, uh, you know, first first passage, first chapter to the uh, Jewish believers. And also here, one more thing that we observe is um, he says that if anyone says they are godly but walk with all the ungodly characteristics he talks about deceiving one's own heart deceiving his own heart now this is also something believers should understand see self-deception is the most dangerous uh, place for a believer because what is happening is a believer is not able to accept their mistakes and they keep saying that I'm right, I'm right when they are wrong. So when we start doing that, when we are not sensitive and humble to the leading of God, what happens? Even if the Holy Spirit convicts us, even if, you know, elders of the church speak to us, even if, you know, somebody counsels us, we are not able to let go of our sin. We are not able to let go of our um, fleshly desires. But we have convinced ourselves. Nothing is wrong with me. So a person who says nothing is wrong with me, that person is self-deceived. And it's very, very dangerous because nobody can help that person to change themselves. Okay? So that is self-deception. So he says, don't get into that. Instead, be humble. Walk humble before the Lord. So now we can move on to uh, James chapter 2 over here. All right. So now uh, we have three more minutes. So maybe the first section, I'll just quickly take it up. So I already said that uh, James has addressed the rich people and the poor people in the church. Okay. And he told that uh, uh, let the rich person walk humbly. Let the poor person be happy when God blesses them. Now, in James chapter 2, he talks about not giving any preferential treatment to the rich person. So this is how he writes it. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory with 
partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings in fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place and say to the poor man, you stand there or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Okay, so I'll just explain verses 1 to 4. Sim in simple words, he's saying, treat everybody equally. Just because some people are rich or it could be that some people are influential. You know, in, it happens, isn't it, in church? Some people come, we know that they have a lot of money, they have a lot of contacts. If anything needs to get done for the church, they will be able to do it for us. So what happens to the um, leader or the leaders if they are not careful? You know, they will tend to be partial to the rich and the influential because we can get some favors. But James very clearly says, no partiality. Everybody is equal. Please do not treat the rich with special treatment and uh, uh, the poor with, you know, like not giving them any importance. And uh, here he says that a poor man, you give him an, a different place. Okay, all the poor sit here, all the rich sit here on better seats. This is not the way God's house should be. Everybody is equal in the kingdom of God. Just because in the world, some people have more resources compared to the others, we should not take that to discriminate between people. Wouldn't it be so sad to be part of a group or a community of believers where there is partiality? It's not at all biblical, isn't it? So uh, that should not happen. You know, have no preferential treatment for the rich people okay so that's what he's saying now let's uh, go for a break 10 minutes we'll come back and we will continue with uh, james chapter 2 verse 5 okay see you soon class yeah thank you